I, I apologize, we're actually on our fifth webinar this week. And the title today is Cornell Dining Menus of Change, Principles Reflected in Our Culinary Program. So what we're gonna learn about today is what Cornell University Dining is doing. We actually have four speakers, I'll introduce them all in a minute. And I, we hope that you'll be able to get some ideas from what Cornell's doing that you might be able to do at your own workplace or school or maybe even in your home. I wanted to mention that ne next week's speaker, Damon Santola, we're changing the time. He's gonna be talking at 8 p.m. on Thursday instead of 8 a.m. So that'll be morning in China. Uh, I know that'll be a really difficult time for our Iranian and European um, participants, but unfortunately, uh, Dr. Santola was not able to come on at 8 a.m., but we will record it. Okay. So, um, there were some, there may have been some confusion about different terms we've been using, like vegan, vegetarian, flexitarian, plant-based, plant-forward. I actually don't want to go into this now because I want to give our speakers more time. But this comes from the menusofchange.org and their annual report. So I suggest going on there if you're having any confusion about terms. And of course, there's lots of other great information in the annual report. All right, so our speakers today, and just a minute, because I'm gonna bring up their bios. So we have Lisa Zare, who's Director of Organizational Excellence at Cornell Dining. And she is a finance and organizational development professional who works with the Cornell Dining Organization. Lisa's first real interaction with the menus of change was at the annual conference at the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York in 2018. And since then, Lisa has been transformed by the evidence provided on the health benefits and the creativity of following a plant-rich diet. She works both with her culinary, nutrition, and sustainability team, as well as the culinary operations team within Cornell Dining's nationally recognized program to celebrate the deliciousness of healthy plant-forward dining options. We also have Michelle Nardi today, who's a registered dietitian nutritionist. And Michelle has been the registered dietitian nutritionist for Cornell Dining since November 2019. She completed her undergraduate studies at Cornell University. So she has experienced Cornell Dining from both the perspective of a student and a leader. Prior to working at Cornell Dining, Michelle worked in healthcare for nearly 10 years. She has enjoyed the transition to university dining, which has provided her the amazing opportunity to work in a preventative setting, exposing students to the amazing colors, flavors, and nutrition that healthy plant-based menus can provide. Anna Ben Shlomo began working for, excuse me, she's the sustainability coordinator, and she began working for Cornell Dining as the sustainability coordinator just this year in January. Before coming to Cornell, Anna worked as a regional catering manager for El Al Israeli Airlines, as a student assistant manager of the Special Diets Kitchen at Ohio, at Iowa State University and as an intern at Central Iowa Veterans Administration Hospital. Anna recently became a registered dietitian and completed her dietetic internship through Iowa State University. The program there is a champion site for the sustainable, resilient, and healthy food and water systems curriculum. And throughout her internship, Anna got to work on several sustainability projects in food service and patient care. Anna and her family have adopted a mostly plant-based diet over seven years ago, among doing other things to help the environment. And finally today, we are very fortunate to have a chef, Chef Chloe Greenhalgia, uh, who started her career with Cornell Dining in 2008. She worked a number of years as a pastry chef and then sous chef for the catering team. She now has been the chef for a majority of dining's retail eateries 
for the past three years. She has a passion for creating health conscious menus with vibrant plant forward flavors. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Zare, who's going to start us off on our presentation today. Great. Thank you, Marianne. Um, let me share my screen here. Okay. So can everybody perfect. So, so welcome to the Plant Rich Diet and Persuading Family and Friends webinar series and welcome virtually to Cornell University. Um, even though it's April 23rd here um, in Ithaca, I want you to know it's still snowing um, as of yesterday and perhaps even today. We may expect a little bit of snow. Um, I'm Lisa Zare, the Director of Organizational Excellence for Cornell Dining, and thank you, Marianne, for the wonderful introduction. Um, so, the, whoop, hold on. Whoop, sorry, okay. Um, the faces that you see uh, on the screen now are the Cornell Dining team who will be presenting to you today. Um, as, as Marianne introduced, Michelle Nardi, who is our Registered Dietitian Nutritionist, um, Anna Ben Shlomo, who's our sustainability coordinator, and Chef Chloe Greenhouse, who is our chef for the majority of our on-campus retail operations. So while the team is going to get into details about some of the specific menus of change principles in the presentation, let me give you some overall details about Cornell University Dining. Cornell University was founded uh, in 1868 uh, by Ezra Cornell, and our main campus has 608 buildings located on more than 2,000 acres. So just to put that in perspective, um, if, if you were uh, in, in the United States in a, in a football field, um, that'd be about 1,500 U.S. footballs altogether, uh, or put together. So you understand that gives you some context of how large our program really is. Um, we do serve over 22,000 meals um, each day. And while we do not require a meal plan um, participation for all of our residents, 98% of our first year students elect to participate in our meal plans. So in total, we have more than 10,500 students on meal plans each year between undergraduate, graduates, and professional students. Uh, we operate 10 dining halls, each with their own chef and unique menu, including one uh, dining hall that's certified gluten, peanut, and tree nut free, one that is Star K certified kosher, and one that has a dedicated Zabiha Halal station, um, which is located in one of our first year dining facilities. We have multiple retail operations, coffee shops, convenience stores, so we have a, a really nice variety um, that, and we serve different menus in all of these places. So we have the opportunity to be very creative. We have more than 15 professional chefs in our organization, um, you, and you'll hear from one of them in just a few minutes. Um, but I will tell you that our chefs never fail to delight our guests with their creativity. And I'm very excited for you to meet Chef Chloe later in this presentation so she can show you how she's partnered her passion for plant forward creations with some of our students' passions for health conscious menus to create a program in one of our facilities um, that's coming soon, Martha's, that you can see is the logo here, um, it, that will be opening new in August. Um, we're also working on uh, a North Campus residential expansion, and this is on our North, uh, Northern Campus where we'll have first and second year students. Um, this includes a new dining facility that we're in the process of designing out right now. Uh, it'll have nine different food platform options, stations, many of which are being designed with a focus on plant forward options. So we're very excited about menus of change and the impact it's going to have in this new facility. Um, I know many of the presentations have been focusing on menus of change and I think that that's fantastic. Um, today we're going to talk to you about our experience with menus of change and our ability to persuade choice, health, and behavior through healthy menuing options. And I will tell you what we've found is 
our students value options and much like uh, the attendees on this webinar you know our our student population is very diverse um, so we found that we have the most success when we make changes to persuade slowly and deliberately um, sometimes without hard selling it to our guests but just letting them go on the journey with us and explore all of these new tastes and colors and textures right alongside of us again through the deliciousness and the excitement of the program we also have a robust student advisory dining committee and this is very exciting um, this committee is comprised of students who represent nutrition sustainability um, and social justice uh, on, on campus and they're really interested in the overall uh, option of enhancing the student dining experience. So they bring us suggestions that inform policy and procedural changes for our program. And we really appreciate their insight and their passion to challenge us to make Cornell dining um, more well-rounded and robust for, for the university. And what we've learned over the years by working with the students, as well as becoming more involved with the Menus of Change program, is that we will have more success when we approach our food program from a broader perspective, um, in that cultivating the long-term well-being of our guests, um, as well as the health of the planet. Um, and we really can do that uh, quite, quite easily, um, you know, just by focusing on, on utilizing the talent that we have and being creative by focusing on the deliciousness of the food we serve. Um, we, through that, we can persuade our guests that plant-rich diets are satisfying, nutritional, and sustainable, um, and that we can support our local economy as well as the health of the planet um, while, while you know, providing this program for our guests. So next, I would like to introduce Michelle Nardi, our registered dietitian nutritionist, who will talk to you more specifically about how Cornell Dining ensures menus of change principles and plant-rich recipes are included in our culinary program. So Michelle. Thank you, Lisa. Cornell joined the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative in 2015. As Lisa mentioned, this partnership has been a driving force for our program over the past five years. We're so grateful for this opportunity to tell you about our journey and about some of the strategies that we've employed to persuade our students to make healthier choices. So thank you. Um, this slide here is just a reminder of the, oops, back, sorry. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> this slide <laughs> is a reminder of the 24 principles of the menus of change. So as you can see, a, a wide range of topics are addressed, ranging from nutrition, like, um, make whole intact grains the new normal, sustainability, including a focus on serving less red meat, um, and operational and menu recommendations as well. We've implemented a number of the strategies and we continue to strive towards reaching more. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, to start, I wanted to just give you a, a little bit of an overview of Cornell's culinary program and about um, some of the standards that we require. So as Lisa mentioned, Cornell has 10 what we refer to as all you care to eat dining halls. So what that essentially means is that you pay one fee to enter the, um, the dining hall or the dining location, and then you're able to eat as much as you like within the dining hall. Um, this model provides us with a captive audience and allows us to expose students to new foods and provide education within that space. I think that's a really huge advantage that we have and that we do a great job taking advantage of. I think that two key strategies for persuasion are education and exposure, and I want to talk through some examples of what we do related to that. So sometimes eating a plant-based diet and trying new foods can be a little bit overwhelming and people might be reluctant to try a new food, particularly if you had to pay for it separately. When you're in our all you care to eat setting, you can try as many foods as you want and it's all the same fee. So if you try something that you don't like, you really haven't lost anything. We really try to use this to our advantage. When we're building our menus for our all you care to eat locations, 
we try to push towards healthy menus of change, focused menus, which we'll talk about in a second here. But we do still include some safe options, like we still have French fries. Um, I, I think that providing healthy choices as well as some kind of safe backup options is really important because it provides our guests with the autonomy to make the healthy choices if they want, and we hope they do, but it doesn't turn off our customers that are looking for those familiar comfort foods. So we've created menu standards that outline a framework that our chefs use when they're designing menus to determine what offerings are available at each meal. And this is how we make sure that the menus that we provide are healthy and balanced, and we offer wonderful plant-based options. So it's through these menu standards that we really drive our program. And I think you can see some of these standards in there. We have including a vegetarian or a vegan option um, or entree at every meal. We try to focus on getting whole grains at least 50% of the time. We focus on using fresh seasonal vegetables as much as possible. Every semester we review these standards and this is just a small subset of it, it's pages and pages long. Um, but we review all of these standards as a method of evaluating our program and a, a way to continue to help us drive forward and make our program better and better every year. Um, so each semester, our culinary wellness and innovation team reviews every single menu for every single all you care to eat location and discuss how the particular menu fits into these standards and what types of strategies each dining hall is using to emphasize those menus of change principle. So these, these are really the foundation to our program. So as I mentioned earlier, in addition to exposure, I, I think another key component of persuasion is education and telling our story. One thing that's kind of unique to university dining is that we always have a new audience every single year as freshmen come to campus. That means we need to remind ourselves to keep telling our story, even if it's the same story, until we're a broken record, because every year those new students don't know that story and we need to keep telling it. One simple way we communicate our story in terms of plant-based diets is that we label all of our foods that are vegetarian and vegan. So right, every food in our All You Care to Eat um, locations has what we call a menu identifier. So it lists what, what the entree is and then it would say vegan or vegetarian. So it's an easy way for our students to know what our plant-based options are. We also do pop-up events, which are really great educational opportunities. Um, and this might highlight something related to nutrition or sustainability. Um, and we try to focus on menus of change principles when we can. As an example, um, Anna, our sustainability coordinator, and I were planning a pop-up event this spring focusing on lentils. Lentils are a great option because as is true for many foods, this was a bonus two for one and address nutrition and sustainability. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we weren't able to actually do the event, but I'll walk you through what it would look like just so you can kind of envision it. So we typically do these events in our All You Care to Eat dining halls. So thousands of students are coming through and they're coming through whether we're doing the event or not. So we get to um, engage some people that may not otherwise necessarily be interested, which is a really neat opportunity. So we work with our chef and culinary team and create a menu focused around the event. So for this lentil event, we featured, we were planning to feature many um, lentil recipes across all of our stations. Anna and I were going to pass out samples of our vegan blended lentil burger, which was developed by the very talented chef Chloe, who you will be hearing from soon. We have interactive trivia games, which our students would use um, in order to learn more about nutrition and sustainable sustainability facts related to lentils. And of course, to make it a little more fun, we would have prizes. But the goal there would be really engaging our students to try the new food and to educate them on the benefits of lentils. Um, all right, next slide. Okay, um, so that was a little bit about other things related to our program. And now I want to talk to you specifically about some of the menus of change principles we've addressed and what our experience has been like. 
So one of the first nutrition related initiatives following the menus of change principles we focused on was cut the salt in 2016. From a health standpoint, we all know that eating excessive salt is linked to high blood pressure, heart disease, and stroke. One of the really neat things about changing to a diet that's lower in salt and lower in sugar specifically is that that decreases your, your craving some for some of those types of foods. So by limiting your intake of salt and sugar and changing that um, environment that your, your food environment that you're exposing your taste buds to can actually change your preferences. And that's hugely important for building habits and food behaviors that can be lifelong. So we employed a lot of different strategies to decrease the sodium in our menus. We reviewed, reviewed all of the recipes and reviewed, removed salt where we could. For instance, we no longer add salt to the pasta water. We also removed all of the salt from the tables. We switched to low sodium beans and we rinsed um, all of our canned vegetables. An additional thing that we rolled out are these flavor stations. So that's what that table is right there. Um, so, thank you, Lisa. So on the flavor stations are a variety of different seasonings, some of which contain salt and some of which don't. So this is getting back to that option piece a little bit. So we adjusted our, men or our recipes so that they're lower in sodium. So hopefully that will be the preferred option. However, if you want to add additional seasoning or if you do want to add salt, that option is here where you can do it individually on a case-by-case um, -case basis. And as you can see by the numbers on the slide, we substantially reduce the amount of sodium in our menus. It's pretty impressive. All right, next please. Another nutritional goal we focused on is our beverage offerings. Um, and this relates to the principle substantially reduce sugary beverage and innovate replacements. So historically, we've offered soda fountains in our dining halls. In 2017, we rolled out a flavored water program as an unsweetened, unsweetened beverage option. So we innovated a new replacement. Uh, the, the flavored water program basically just adds in fruits or vegetables or herbs to different beverage or to water. So an example might be cucumber water. In fall 2019, we pushed this a little farther and we actually removed soda from our all you care to eat locations and switched over to seltzer water. So this wasn't, this was more of a decision that we just made and kind of waited to see what happened. Um, so we didn't, ex exactly persuade anybody on this. We just rolled it out. And the interesting thing was we really, in the scheme of things, didn't get a lot of compliments, I, or I'm sorry, complaints. I, I won't say that there wasn't any negative comments, but in general, it was really very successful. So we did still keep the option to purchase soda on campus. So it, we're not a soda-free campus by any means, but in our All You Care to Eat locations, it's, the soda is not available, and that's made a huge change um, to our food environment. So if you click here, Lisa. I think one more click. <laughs> um, by just simply by taking soda out of our food environment, or out of our dining halls and our All You Care to Eat locations, we took eight tons of sugar per year out of the Cornell food system, which is just overwhelming to me. So I'm gonna let that one sink in for a little bit. That's a lot of sugar. All right, next slide, please. So another strategy we've used to promote a plant-based diet is what we sometimes refer to as stealth. So in 2015, we rolled out what we refer to as the protein flip. So this was a program that increased the vegetable content and decreased the meat content in a number of menu items. For instance, we created recipes for meatballs, burgers, and meatloaf that contain traditional ground beef, but also 30% mushrooms. So pictured here on the right is a beautiful blended burger. And this is focusing on the principle serve less red meat less often. As you know, the shift towards limiting red meat is beneficial from both a health and sustainability standpoint. And like Dr. Fox uh, discussed in her presentation on the Eat Lancet report, 
I think there's a large area of opportunity for improving the diet of people that are flexitarian, which was one of those um, words on that slide. Basically, people who eat both meat and a plant-based diet. So if you look at that food prints um, or image over on the left, you can see that translate, transitioning from a meat lover's diet to an average diet or really a healthy diet in terms of red meat or healthier diet in terms of red meat consumption can make a huge impact on the environment. So I think we have a really great area of opportunity in reaching these guests who need to just decrease their red meat a little bit and we can really make that huge change. So the blended burgers help us appeal to the audience of people that might be turned off by a veggie burger, but would be accepting of our blended burger. Next slide, please. So the last menus of change principle that I'm gonna talk about is about being transparent about our sourcing and preparation. So we have specific purchasing standards that we use um, and we review every single item that comes into, every single food item that comes into our, um, our system. So some of the things that we look for are products without any MSG, no trans fat, no added nitrites or nitrates, and no soy in the meat. We also provide only um, fluid dairy ice cream and yogurt that's RBST free. And what we're really looking at, at focusing on right now is avoiding products with artificial colors and artificial flavors. That one is a little bit challenging um, so it's definitely a work in progress, but that's where we're striving right now. So it's really important that we bring products into our system that we can stand behind and that we feel comfortable putting that Cornell Dining name behind. Um, so as we think about our journey in the future towards improving our plant forward menus and menus of change, we're extremely excited to have the opportunity to build a brand new dining hall like Lisa was talking about. Our sustainability coordinator, Anna, will tell you a little bit more about Cornell Dining's sustainability efforts in this area. Hello, everyone. Um, so the principle I will talk about and works perfectly with what we are doing on our, on the, when designing our new facility, new dining facility, is design health and sustainability into operations and dining spaces. Uh, so some more highlights about this facility. It is scheduled to open actually and hopefully in the fall of 2021. It just depends on how quick we'll be able to finish the construction because of what is happening right now. And this is an all you care to eat dining hall that will serve almost 6,000 meals a day. So breakfast, lunch and dinner and snacks between. Uh, it is going to be a large facility, uh, 50,000 square feet, and this building will also be Gold LEED certified. And for those of you that are not familiar with LEED, LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It is a green building certification program that is used worldwide. Uh, all the equipment we're buying will be NSF and Ener Energy Star certified. Um, and NSF um, International is an organization that provides uh, certification for various areas um, and the, the NSF mark assures consumers, retailers and regulators that the products have been rigorously tested to comply with all standard requirements. And the Energy Star is actually a program that is run by the U.S. Environmental um, Protection Agency. And it promotes in the US Department of Energy and it promotes energy efficiency. And this program provides information on energy consumption of products and devices, and it uses different standardized methods. Um, so example of energy cert, energy star certified um, uh, equipment is energy efficient foods. They will automatically shut down when not in use. Uh, and instead of working continuously. Um, so some of them, um, uh, we, we had some in, so Ithaca is extremely beautiful. Um, if you ever visit, you will see how gorgeous it is, but it's also kind of centrally isolated. Uh, we are a four hour drive from New York City. 
So our remote location prevented us from purchasing um, a top of the line dishwashing machine because um, we cannot get service. The service comes from New York City. So if it goes down four hours, we cannot allow that. So we had to go with something that we could get service here and still energy certified. Um, so, and some financial considerations included budgeting for regular somat pulper instead of more uh, water saving hydro extractor. And we will still use the pulper to produce slurry which will be turned into compost by Cornell Farm Services as it is done now. And just to not, uh, let you know, uh, we compost all our pre-consumer food waste, food scraps. And this is actually done on the Con Cornell campus. So we have our own farm services that do it and basically turn our waste into um, compost. And uh, last year alone, we sent almost 700 tons of food scraps for composting. Um, next slide, please. So when it comes to the menus, um, they are being designed with health and sustainability in mind. We are relying heavily on menus of change in designing those new menus. Um, we will be focusing uh, on farm to student concept and we'll be using local and regional seasons when uh, products when in seasons just like we do right now um, local produce will come in bulk and we will be buying whatever the farmer is growing instead of mandating them what to grow so that will help them to be more sustainable uh, and it will help us to use what is in season and what is available in the area we will continue offering in this facility abundant vegan and vegetarian options. Um, when it comes to salad bar toppings, salad bars typically produce a lot of food waste. Um, and our chefs came up with an idea of using more roasted and pickled toppings. And this will extend shelf life and also reduce food waste at the end of the day. Um, 50% of the stations, and just like Michelle mentioned, there will be nine of them, will be fully customizable. So students can build their own meals. Um, for example, at the pizza and the pasta stations. Pasta will be homemade. Uh, lots, pretty much all of it will be made from scratch. All the food is, will, is made from scratch, which, incre which increases customer satisfaction. And hopefully, it also leads to reducing food waste because food is delicious, freshly made. People can build their own meals. It will help them to minimize food waste in us. Uh, we will continue. We will continue with our no sugar beverages um, policy uh, sodas. We will serve build your own smoothies. Uh, we will continue with our spa water program and also tea. Uh, some stations will be designed to be uh, like a one-stop shop uh, where you don't have to go around to build your meal. Um, it will have everything from the starter through the bread. And this actually can reduce the number of plates people are taking and in turn will reduce uh, energy and water use. And finally, we, one of the ways to monitor customer satisfaction is visiting with students and checking food waste, plate waste uh, throughout meals. So this also can really help us um, reduce our waste. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things we've done, Cornell been, been doing for a very long time, uh, we became trayless. We stopped using trays in our dining halls back in 2008. So this is something that can, extremely, can be extremely helpful in reducing your energy and water use and also reduce waste because people cannot pile as much uh, on a single plate and, when, and, and not a tray. So we've been doing it for a very long time. Um, and our plates, uh, if you come to our dining halls, you will notice that our plates are pretty small. So if you want more food, you probably will have to go back. Um, and we can move to the next slide, please. And another principle we are using, trying to follow um, as much as we can, is buy fresh, local, seasonal, and global. Uh, so 27 of all of our fresh produce 
is locally or regionally sourced. So you will ask why not more? Uh, and that's mostly because Ithaca is located uh, in Northeast US and our climate does not allow uh, a long grow growing season. We only have summer and that's why only 27% is local or regionally grown. And you can see from the map, we have multiple farms and um, that provide us with food. Some of the hyper-local suppliers, we basically have them here in Ithaca, is Cornell Dairy and Cornell Orchards. Uh, we, grow, we grind our own peanut butter and we sell it at our retail location, locations. And we also buy bread and bakery products from Ithaca Bakery, which is a local bakery in Ithaca. And one aspect of persuasion uh, I can mention is that every fall we have, we host large farm to fork dinners at our all you care to eat facilities. And they really showcase the local growers and students. Um, it helps the students learn where the food, the food is coming from. Um, so all the milk and ice cream and most of the yogurt and, uh, and all you care to eat facilities come from Cornell Dairy. And we also serve local apples from Cornell Orchard pretty much all year long. It depends on their harvest, of course. So um, I think I always say we eat with our eyes and it is a big part of persuasion. If the food looks good, we will be willing to eat it. And so now Chef Chloe will talk about what she did when she redesigned the menu to be more plant forward at one of our popular retail cafes, Martha's Cafe. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm going to talk about one of our retail um, shops, which is located in uh, the Martha Van Rensselaer building on Cornell's campus, and um, it also houses the College of Human Ecology. And so this eatery has been in that building for quite a long time. Um, and in the, when I started there, we had um, a pretty great variety of things. We had sandwiches and, you know, flatbreads and um, burrito bowls that had whole grain brown rice. Um, so we weren't doing too bad with um, some sort of health conscious items to, to be offered there, but we did rely heavily on um, more meat protein flavors as opposed to um, trying to layer some plant flavors. So um, with that, we, uh, we set out to, to design a new menu as Martha's is going um, into a construction and being completely remodeled. Um, we, Talk to the students and um, gave them a, a, an option to be a part of what Martha's will be. Um, so next slide. So with that and in a partnership with uh, the College of Human Ecology and with Cornell Dining being heavily um, our commitment to menus change, I wanted to focus on as there are many principles with menus of change, I wanted to focus on three that were uh, very important to me for this menu. Um, and for that, it was focusing on whole minimally processed foods, um, thinking produce first as much as possible and serving less red meat less often. So next slide. Um, and with that, we, um, you know, the students really asked for more healthy options. They wanted more grains, they wanted more legumes. They really sort of helped drive this. And luckily our dedication to menus of change was a perfect partnership in designing this menu. Um, the students also had, uh, for a grade in one of their classes, also had a part in designing the logo that you see there. And we, um, we really wanted to have a more sustainably conscious and plant forward menu. Um, the students really asked for more plant-based proteins. We really in the old Martha's menu just had some beans and maybe tofu. 
I think a lot of times for plant persuasion, tofu is just not something that people really want to do or they don't want to try it um, or they have tried it and they don't like it the way it's prepared. So we needed to have some other options to persuade people to try other um, varieties of plant-based protein options. So I went and removed all the beef from this particular menu and deli meats, which really reduces, um, you know, one of the, the highest um, unsustainable meat proteins that there are. Uh, I tried to find some more plant-based options like falafel and lentil mushroom meatballs. Um, also incorporating a lot of other vegetables and oats into those meatballs. So really you get sort of a very rounded uh, protein and grain uh, 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 different from, from meat protein where you're just eating meat, you're getting a lot of different varieties in one, um, in one thing. So we added more grains and legumes as asked for by the students, uh, a wider variety of vegetables as opposed to just you know, tomatoes and lettuce, which were on burrito bowls. Um, and then we really wanted to create more uh, flavorful layering sauces like harissa and shug, which actually help you, we, they have, with the layering of roasting vegetables and adding pickled vegetables and then, and then sauces like that, you almost forget that the meat is there. It is definitely like on the side of the plate and everything else is on the forefront and you're, you're taking in a lot more vegetables than you ever thought you, you would. Um, this may not be uh, a problem that's in other countries, but here in America, we tend to eat a lot of meat um, and also sometimes a lot of uh, poorly processed meat, uh, which is really a detriment to a lot of health uh, issues. So, um, so really with that, I wanted to use more global recipes too. So we did falafel, uh, which people have been really excited about um, making a really fresh falafel that doesn't come from a powder that's really minimally processed. Um, it's only processed by the chef, meaning we just break it down and then put it together. We don't, it doesn't run through any um, machine process or it doesn't have any added chemicals to it makes it just ha have a really vibrant flavor and falafel has been a really welcome um, addition to the menu. Um, yes, and with that, adding as much color as I possibly could to just, you know, your eyes just go straight to everything and it's almost like you want to try everything and there's so many different ways that you can create your own bowl with this menu that um, it's almost uh, impossible not to eat vegetables. <laughs> Um, yeah, and with that, I'm, I'm excited to actually open in the fall, if everything goes as planned, and to, uh, you know, get people excited about this type of food and realize that the layering of flavors is what's really important to uh, your diet with vegetables. And that's about it for me. Well, thank you so much. This was great. We have a lot of questions. It's actually, this is great. We still have 15 minutes before nine o'clock. So if you are willing, um, I will start sharing some of the questions. And also, if one of you wants to follow the chat, well, because there'll probably be more questions while I'm reading you some of the questions that were already posted. So, um, so let me just, uh, sort of start here. There were, there was a, a bunch of questions at the beginning about potatoes and why you're limiting potatoes. Uh, well, I, I can sort of take that one. And, um, and Anna, I think you and I both agree that the, that menus have changed principle and Michelle, if you have anything to say, um, isn't, isn't one of my most favorite of the, all the principles. Um, I don't, I feel like potatoes are a really important part of your diet. Um, I think what happens in America is um, the excess that people eat them or fry them and eat them and in, in the like in fries or eating fast food is is really what they mean by that and it, and it should be a little bit more specific but no potatoes I think are, are a very important part of the diet so yeah I'm not excited about that one as much but I do like all the other principles 
I don't know if you have anything to add, Michelle or Anna. So I think when we when Cornell Dining looks at these principles, we're choosing which which ones we want to specifically focus on and what it means to us. Um, potatoes have a lot of great nutrition and they're affordable. We can grow them locally in upstate New York, which is a great opportunity for us. Um, so they're not really something that we're focusing on right now. And, and so, and just sort of more broadly, is the, what was the principle? Was it reducing starch, so corn and potatoes was what the menus of change is recommending? No, it specifically limit potatoes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And you think that's because people use them in the fried form? Yeah, there, there's a lot of not so healthy ways to eat potatoes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, there's other, other, it's not, it's not a very clear um, principle. Okay. So, um, yeah, but there are other unhealthy, obviously mashed potatoes. We're a big mashed potato country too. <laughs> so, you know, stuff okay. like that. So more of the, the fat added is, is yes. the issues that you're concerned about. Okay, so great. So that brings us, there was quite a big discussion about oils and some people were saying that there's no health, healthy oils, period. And so I was just kind of wondering what your take is on oils. If there are healthy oils that we can eat or should we be limiting oils, uh, taking them out of our diet? I, I can take that question. So oils are a source of fat, right? So actually we recommend that about 30% of the calories that you eat come from fat. So oils can be healthy. You want to make sure that you're choosing well-balanced oils. So olive oil, for instance, is high in omega-3s. Fat is important um, to help us absorb some of our fat, that's fat soluble vitamins such as vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin E, and vitamin K. Um, would definitely not recommend a, a super fat free diet unless you have a particular medical condition that requires that. Um, and adding healthy fats is a great strategy. Um, we need to be mindful. So fat higher in calories than other types of foods. So you can easily overdo it, but the proper amount using healthy oils is a, a really important part of a healthy diet. Okay, thank you. So we have a question, what makes it a menu of change? Is it simply because it's rich in plant-based? Boy, I can try taking a stab at that. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> And, and I don't, I don't know when, when menus of change first came out and I don't know if you remember, I can reshare my screen, but the, the poster with these principles, there's 24 different principles that all lead to menus of change. You know, so we, we initially started, you know, just taking them off one by one until we took a step back and thought, you know, menus of change really is about being conscious of many different things about plant forward. Um, it's not about getting rid of animal protein, but it's about making it not the center of the plate. So more of a garnish, a secondary thought. Um, eat less often. Um, it's about being biodiverse and sustainable and supporting your local economy. You know, and, and there used to be the thought where, you know, a, a larger, um, university or, or food producer would go to a farmer and say, I want you to grow me this, this, and this. Hmm. Um, and now what we're doing is we're going to the farmers to say, what crops do you need to grow to sustain the health and, and nutrient value in your soil? And we will work that into our menuing and our recipes. So it's kind of just flipping how you think about where you get your product, what product you're using, um, how often you're serving uh, animal proteins versus plant proteins. Um, and that's really the, the, the way we're looking at menus of change. Okay, thank you. So it sounds like you look at those 20 plus principles and then you prioritize some of them, but not all of them. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, and then this is a great um, question here from Jen Hook. She says, these women have such a collectively excellent education and professional backgrounds and their presentation is fabulous. 
Can they recommend a cookbook or two to help us as individuals get going with this type of eating? So some of my favorite uh, cookbooks or the series actually is um, Odo Lenghi's um, Simple series. It's a great book. It's easy, just like it said, it's called Simple. There's a couple of different ones. There's a lot of layers of vegetable flavors. It's not devoid of meat. There is some meat products in some of his books. It's just, it really concentrates on flavor. So I would say pick up some of those and uh, you would be set. <laughs> Chloe, could you spell out the author's name so somebody can type it in the chat? Um, it's uh, O-T-T-O. -O. Um, how do you spell, Anna, do you know how to spell his? L-E- I, I think it's O-O-T-T-O-L-E-N-G-H-I. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Lengi. Okay. And it's so a hard one to spell. <laughs> and the series is just called Simple? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Um, so there was a question about, is there any study that's monitoring the change or health impact on students who participate in the programs in your culinary, well, in the eating programs at Cornell? Have you collaborated with any researchers? Michelle? Sure. So, are you, I guess is a question in the, the dining halls, do we do any research studies in terms of health? Yeah, yeah I think so, because it says participate in the diet program. So maybe even, are they changing their diet? Maybe not even directly on their health outcomes, but just sort of, you know, I was also wondering related to this, the whole idea of nudges and, for, and the idea that maybe you place your healthy moods, uh, foods like upfront, so students are more likely to choose them. So I guess maybe think of more broadly, are you collaborating with any researchers? Are you monitoring any outcomes of the steps that you're taking? Not that I'm aware of, but I think that there's a huge opportunity to be doing some of that. I think especially when we open up um, our new dining hall, there's tons of opportunities that would be really neat to roll out. So I think that's something we should think about. Thank you for that idea. Okay, great. All right, so um, yeah, I mean, I think it's obviously Cornell has a huge nutrition program, and so it would be a great opportunity. So mm -hmm. anyway, okay. So there was a lot of discussion about not adding salt to the pasta water. And people were thinking, well, then students will just make up for it by adding salt directly to their pasta. Um, yeah, they will add more at the table. Ditto for cereals. Um, and also, oh, this is interesting. Some people can taste the stainless steel in cereals. I, I assume that's like oatmeal if they're cooked without salt. So did you, did you, do you have any insights on that question? So um, I, I can't speak to it as much from a culinary standpoint and maybe Chloe, you can help me with that. But um, I think part of the, emphasis behind this change is to let each student choose individually. If we're adding salt to the dish initially, that means that everybody is going to be getting that higher level of salt. So we still have salt available to be, to be added on an individual basis. And if you prefer to add salt, that's fine. We, we're not saying that that's not okay. Um, but we let each individual make that decision rather than making a blanket statement that everybody's going to have this higher level of salt. So with that said, we also um, don't have salt as much on the tables. Mm -hmm. We do have flavor stations where they have um, ground chilies and, and dried herbs mm -hmm. that actually add flavor in place of salt sometimes. So um, people will go to those or hot sauces and stuff like that. So instead of adding just a pile of salt directly to your dish, you're adding a little bit of flavor, which enhances the dish in a different way. Interesting. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on to another question. There was a discussion about soy. And I think maybe it was Chloe or Michelle said that you don't use soy. There was a, a meat. Soy yeah. and meat. Um, and so, 
you know, some people thought maybe it's because <laughs> so much soy has GMOs or because doctors think it's an estrogen mimicker. So is it, why are you reducing soy? So there's a, go ahead, you go ahead. Specifically in the meat, I think, Michelle, just so you, that's what it was about, not, not the tofu, but the added two meats. Okay. So um, Michelle can tell you about that. So there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, number one is that transparency piece. Usually a product, a meat product without added soy would be what we refer to as cleaner or um, just less additives, right? Which is really important. And then another piece um, that we focus on a lot is on students with food allergies. So soy is one of the top food allergies in the US. Um, so we wanna limit as many foods with soy as we can um, in terms of um, non-natural sources. So that's another important reason for that decision. So does that mean that you would reduce, like, okay, so tofu would be fine because people can definitely identify that and know exactly. you can take it. But what, it, so I know you're using some lentils and I assuming you're adding some other bean dishes. Are you trying to say do garbanzo beans and not soy because of the allergy issue? As a general statement, we try to avoid adding um, those top allergens in as many products as possible. Not that we totally take them out of the dining hall by any means, and we definitely have things like tofu and um, all of that. But if we can find a product that doesn't have those allergens, then we try to go with that type of product. Okay. And I, because there were quite a few questions about allergens also, and I know you mentioned early on that there's one dining hall that's peanut and tree nut free, but so it sounds like you're doing other things though in all the dining halls to reduce, aller to, to address allergy allergies. Yep, so it's really important for us that we can accommodate students with food allergies and we really want them to be able to navigate our dining halls um, by themselves just like anybody else. So we, we label all of our foods for what allergies are contained in them. Um, and we really try to make it as easy as possible for those students with food allergies. And a big piece to that is making sure that we're sourcing products that have as many, as, as few um, allergens as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the, here's a question um, that asks, is there any study looking at if buying food items a la carte reduces food waste compared to one payment for all you can eat or vice versa? I mean, we haven't, Lisa, do you want to take that? We haven't done any studies on it, but we do have quite a few a la carte eateries on campus. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and we've honestly looked at it kind of from the other perspective also, um, when, when, with the type of meal plans that are offered and the hours of service that are offered. So I think what, we, what, what happens is when you think about an all-you-care-to-eat facility, the name itself kind of encourages you to eat all you can. Mm -hmm. And that's not really what the facility is there for. It's more there for, you know, go in, get your subsistence, and, and leave. So we're kind of looking at, um, you know, if we have extended hours, if more of our meal plans were um, all inclusive, meaning unlimited or all access is what we're, we're thinking of, students would go in, just take what they need and leave, know they could go back and take what they need and leave. It would reduce waste. It would help with uh, the food security concept. Um, Cause I know there was another question in the chat about, you know, about hunger and food insecurity. Um, you know, so if students have more access to food on a regular basis, they'd be less likely to take more than they need and waste food and take just what they need, knowing they can come back when they need to. Um, I think buying a la carte, certainly people are going to buy less, but I, don't, I think that might be more of a financial factor because as you continually add things to your bill, it's gonna cost you more than it costs you to go into an all you care to eat facility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and there was a related question about what do you do with post-consumer food waste? So I know you've talked about all your sort of, you know, when you're trimming vegetables and so forth, 
That goes to the Cornell composting facility. Thank you, because I'm using it on my garden. I just had a delivery the other day. Um, but what about, I, I don't, I haven't heard that you're collaborating, say, with food kitchens or any soup kitchens or anything like that for the, uh, well, I guess there's several kinds of waste, right? So there's right. what the students throw out, but there's also what you have to throw out because it's gone bad or wasn't served that evening. I'm gonna let Anna take this question. Yeah, I can I can answer. So there just to start, so you know, in the kitchen, so for before you start, Anna, the, the trim vegetable waste is not does not go in the compost for me. It goes into the freezer and then removed later to make vegetables. So oh, okay. I, I try to limit my compost of, of oh. certain things that are, are what I call gold, <laughs> vegetable gold. So just so you know, not everything, it, the compost still is a waste. So mm -hmm. I have to even limit that as much as possible. So okay, that, great. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's a, that's a great technique uh, and a great way to reduce waste. But um, uh, so I'll just several aspects. Waste. You said about the post-consumer, uh, so what students leave on their plates. So in all your care to eat facilities, uh, they put their used plates on a dish belt that goes uh, back to the back of the kitchen. And then the, this food waste is scraped and actually goes to the pulper that grinds the waste and that goes to compost. This way we can also compost all the napkins that people leave on their plates. Hmm. That's one way of dealing with post-consumer waste. In retail locations where we don't have the ability uh, um, to scrape the plates um, this way, at some of them we do have compost bins that people will scrape their food scraps into the, the bins and they will be collected as well and composted. Um, and finally, we also do food waste studies. Uh, we have five student sustainability coordinators, and they come to the dining halls uh, almost every day of the week. They set up a table and students voluntarily give their plates with what's left on them. And they also answer a few questions about like, wh uh, what was the reason they left the food on the plate? And is it a typical um, amount of waste for them? Uh, and those um, audits, those food waste studies help us and help the chefs to know what, what is going on. Not just like looking at the place waste on their side, but asking the students, maybe they didn't like the food. So we can give this feedback to chefs and next time they will um, take a look at the menu and maybe change it. Um, so I think, th I think that's it pretty much. Well, what about the waste? It, yep. I don't know if you call it waste, but say you made something that's perishable and you have some. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, actually, one more thing. We do partner with um, a student organization, uh, Food Recovery Network. They mm -hmm. are a volunteer based student organization. They collect all the, um, the food that was not served, that was never reached the, the serving line. So sometimes there is an overproduction and people didn't eat everything they need. And they actually do take it to a local food bank. And that happens at four of our locations uh, several times a week. Mm -hmm. And this way we also divert waste from the, um, uh, from uh, food from waste. And another technique, and Chloe maybe t can tell more about it, if we have some of the things that we didn't serve that, but can be repurposed, such let's say we cook too much meat, a, a large piece of meat that was not served entirely, you can use this meat the next day in other dishes, such as soup or maybe pasta or uh, some sort of sauce. So these leftovers are being recycled uh, in, into other dishes. Hmm. Okay, great. That was really helpful. All right, so then um, we had a comment of pop, Cornell is part of an agricultural school, which is true. I'm part of, I'm in that school. Um, what kind of interaction occurs between the agricultural and the experimental programs and dining? I know you mentioned that you get some of your foods from like Cornell orchards. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's the extent of your collaboration with our college, the agricultural college in terms of maybe we source, we provide a source of some of your foods. I also, I saw that we had a peanut butter 
production at Cornell, which I didn't know about. So maybe you can comment on that. So we have, um, we do make our own peanut butter um, right down on West Campus in Jansen's Market. Uh, we grind it ourselves and sell it. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's all natural. Um, I, I will say it's the best all natural peanut butter I've ever had. Um, we do partner with uh, Cornell Orchards. We also partner with Cornell Dairy. Um, most of our dairy products, milk comes from the dairy plant. Um, we historically have partnered with the agricultural, um, the Homer Thompson Farms and the um, Agricultural Experimental Station. The hard thing for us is combining the the missions of both colleges or the college and the dining right so college is there for research um they're not necessarily there to produce for dining so there are times where we partner with them uh you know in the fall we've used the corn the sweet corn they've grown at all at our fall harvest dinner um, and it's absolutely delicious and wonderful you know we've partnered and used some of the potatoes some of the winter squashes um you know it, it just Sometimes it depends on resources. Um, the farm is there to do research. So the whole business end of it, collecting the food, delivering the food, billing the food is not necessarily a part of their core competency and their mission. Mm -hmm. um, so we partner when we can. Um, there, I'd like to think there's opportunity to partner a little bit more, but, but those obviously would be ongoing discussions. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is a question, I, it's almost a food science question. So do you know of any efforts to extend the season for local produce? Uh, this um, person asked through creation of a frozen food plant, but that might not be the only, other, the only way to extend the season for local produce. Yeah, that's a that's another great question. Um, <laughs> I, I would love to see a frozen food plant, but <laughs> that's that's a really interesting question. I I, I don't know um, of anything. You know, we there is there is an operation. Um, maybe you've seen it on Route 13 farm. Facility that did I freeze the, the girls? Yes. we didn't hear you said there's an operation on route 13 that and then uh, it's it, it grows lettuce right uh, is it the hydroponic plant there that grows uh, lettuce. Uh, um other than that I'm not I'm not sure of, of you know any local greenhouses um that are purposely built to extend the growing season uh -huh. in this area. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is, a, this is an interesting question. And then if, um, if the person who asked wanted more information, you could send us an email at our yeah. Pacific Ecology at cornell.edu because there is somebody in plant sciences at Cornell who produced, who designed hoop houses, which are a very low tech way to extend the season for local growers. Um, they're kind of a very simple, maybe you guys know more about them than I do, just sort of a, almost a pop-up greenhouse. So that might be something that people could use also. Sure. Um, so I think this question, let me, I'll, I'll read the question. It's not, doesn't quite accurately reflect what we're talking about, but I still think it's a good question. So the Questioner says, we're talking here about young people in urban populations. So we're really talking about young people, yes, but our students, a lot of them come from farm families. Many of them are not from the city, although of course many of them are from New York City and of course other cities around the world. And then the questioner goes on to say, do you work also in rural areas? I know this isn't really your, um, you know, you're working at Cornell, so you're not really charged with working in different areas around the country or state, but it is an interesting question, I think, of sort of is this food sustainability movement more in urban areas or are there other things going on that are in rural areas? I don't know if you're aware of these sorts of food sustainability movements. 
So what I will tell you is um, the Menus of Change is really a university research collaborative. So there are more than 40, 40 or 50 universities who participate in this from all over the, the country. So, you know, Columbia University in New York City participates, uh, Harvard University in Boston participates, uh, Boulder in University in Colorado participates, Stanford University participates. So even though Cornell is not considered, we're, we're considered more rural, there are a lot of universities participating in this university research collaborative who, who are in more urban areas and they most certainly are focusing on more of a sustainable uh, plant forward program. So I think that it, it, it is um, reaching more, um, more cities and, and you know, more urban places rather than, than rural. Um, I think it really, it really is more of a, a conscious effort you know, on behalf of the organization to say that this is what we want to follow. Google follows this. Um, WeWork, if, if anybody has ever heard of, of the, the organization called WeWorks, um, they also follow this in all of their buildings that they put up. And what WeWorks is, if you don't know, it's like a conglomeration of smaller companies that all share the same resource building um, food service within. Um, but they subscribe to, to this, this Menus of Change uh, philosophy. So um, I don't know if that answered the question, but, but I would say that I do think that this is not just, a, you know, a rural, a rural um, opportunity. I yeah. think I can add a little bit more on what Cornell does and not necessarily related to Menus of Change or dining. Cornell uh, has a cooperative extension uh, that have locations throughout all the counties in, uh, in upstate New York. And they, uh, what they do, they offer classes uh, from gardening, how to grow your own vegetables to cooking. And that also can really help with uh, plant forward diet. And it, I think we all can agree that eating plant based is cheaper than eating meat. So uh, in some more rural commu communities, uh, people are also more struggling a little bit more financially and have less access to uh, food. So again, co this cooperative extension does a phenomenal job at um, offering classes and education on these issues. Yeah, and it's actually a, a s all over the US in every state. Mm -hmm. So. Right. And so, so that, that's a great point, Anna, that through the U.S. system of cooperative extension programs throughout, in counties throughout the country, there's a lot of opportunities for nutrition. And it's free, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not their cooperative extension, how much they're following this sort of menus of change and some of these newer research findings about food and about food and sustainability as well as health, I'm not sure. I think in New York we probably are, but I don't know about other states. All right, so interesting issue though, thank you. So we have a question, can the beef and deli meat be replaced with chicken in the menu? And, and we're almost to the end of the questions. I know it's 9.15, so. Um, yeah, so I, I, I removed the beef and, and deli meats from from the Martha's menu, um, specifically because beef being one of the most unsustainable uh, meats that we consume. Um, and then the deli meats being one of the most unhealthy meats that we consume, depending on, you know, where you get them. Even if, you know, you get uh, nitrate free, it's still highly processed. Um, you can make, you know, deli meats a little bit better for you, but it would, behoove you to eat more whole uh, muscle meats uh, more often than not and uh, to eat more vegetables. So I did replace it with a, a chicken that's on the menu that is um, got a lot of herbs and, and stuff on it. So I feel like uh, chicken also has its downfalls um, as do any sort of factory farm meats, um, but reducing uh, or having a more wide variety of plant-based and animal proteins will actually keep you 
from eating just the same thing, I think, every day. Um, and I think that's the problem is the excess at which we eat meat on a daily basis and not limiting some of our, our options on certain days and, and just cutting back a little bit or making small little changes, um, I think is, is the most important thing that you can do to start being more sustainable and healthy at the same time. Um, since it is, actually I scrolled down, we do have several more questions. I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not, I can't remember how long that you all said you can stay. Um, certainly if anybody needs to leave and some of you can stay on to answer the last several questions, that'd be great. But I want to give you an option since we've already gone 17 minutes past the ending time. So really appreciate that you're willing to answer all these interesting questions. Sure. Shall I continue? And if somebody needs to leave, you can. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, there's a question about, if, um, I know that you work with a lot of student groups and, and it was really interesting to hear about how the student groups are pressuring you not only to do healthy and sustainable meals, but also ideas about social justice to incorporate them in your cooking and your meal planning. Uh, but the question is, are, do students also get an opportunity to get closer to the whole food chain? Um, and then slightly different question, but from the same um, from the same questioners is, what about local farmers? And do you, I see that you work with local farmers, but do you see them changing too as a result of maybe pressure from you because of demand from students? So, there's, so there's a couple questions buried in there. For, let me address the, the student question first. Um, we, as an organization, um, employ well over a, a, a thousand employees, 600, so more than half of those are student employees. So we have students who um, will work with Chef Chloe, uh, you know, they may, um, run a station, they may fill a salad bar, um, they work their way up into management. So we have student managers, um, we have student assistant directors and directors of the whole student organization. So we have opportunities for students to touch the food system, not only from a consumer side, but from um, you know, a producer and, and a worker side as well. Um, and, and we gain very valuable insight from, from that whole process and it's wonderful. Um, you know, as far as what the students are asking for um, impacting the farmers and how we interact with them, we actually interact more with our distributor. So we work with a, a local company um, that acts as the intermediary between us and the farms. Um, so we don't actually go out and source from the farmers. Maine's Produce will do that for us. But we talk with Maine's and tell them, this is what our students are asking us for, this is what they're looking for, or this is what we're looking for. And they will work with the farmers um, to help um, enhance their, their um, programs, to you know, maybe suggest different items um, that they may wanna um, work into their growing rotation. Um, I don't know, Chef, if you have any other insight to add to that. No, I think that 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 works. That's yeah. good. I mean, we, you know, obviously we feed a lot of people. Um, we would love to to use all farmers that are more local being hyper local and all of that and, and use more Cornell facilities, but it's just not plausible with the amount of people that we have to feed every day, um, sometimes three meals a day. Um, so you know, we, we do our best to be as responsible as possible. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we'll only get better at it as um, more farmers decide to, to do what is important to them too, um, and is important to their farms and their soil. And, and soil health is, is also a study that goes on at Cornell, and I think that's one of the most important parts of, of farming. And uh, hopefully, you know, <sighs> Farmers have a really hard, hard job. So um, I really, it's, it's hard because it, it, it pulls at my heartstrings to be able to like, 
constantly give people all this food and, and make them so happy, but then also think about where your food comes from. And that's something that is an important part of the education of just your everyday life of eating. Um, when, when you go get fast food, you think about where it comes from. I think that's where you start in your life. Um, and that's really what will help um, change the world is just letting people know that um, there's some kids out there that have no idea that onions are grown in the ground. You know, um, the education I think is, is the most important part of directing. And that may be, you know, straying off of the question, but you know, uh, anyway. <laughs> no, but I think you make a good point, Chef. And I think, you know, watching some of the comments that have been coming through, you know, talking about yeah, I know too. change and, you know, growing and, and how do you, yeah. How do you promote sustainable growing in in like an urban area in a city? And it's funny because that's one of the things that you know that is very important that we do um, start to tell that story. Uh, one location uh, on our campus, it's called the West Campus House System, um, is actually looking at a green area in that section of campus where they can start growing gardens, so students can actually have that impact. Um, put seeds in dirt, see what it's like, watch the, the produce grow, and then use that in our dining facilities. Um, and I think, Chloe, to your point that you were making, you know, it's important to, to start, you know, even in the K through 12 uh, realm, teaching, teaching students that if you just put seeds in dirt, you can grow your own food and it's not, it's not really all that difficult. Um, you know, and sometimes, you know, doing a seed exchange is great. You can spend, you know, $2 on a packet of seeds and or if you have heirloom produce, you know, you know, available to you, um, you can pull seeds out and, and dry them and grow them for, you know, save them for the next year, trade them with your friends. Um, it's, it, that's really important to, to, to focus on and, and teach people that, that that's an option. Yeah, it starts early. <laughs> it start early in our, in our system, in our school system. So I, if you don't mind, I'll do two more questions here. And one is related, several questions related to the idea of how do you convince people that the plant-based protein is as nutritious as meat-based protein? In fact, can we do well with a plant-based protein? And then a related question is, how can we convince people that they shouldn't eat meat while they said we could be healthy? Um, and it goes on, I don't like meat, but I know people who eat meat and are healthy. For example, I know in the US people use to barbecue, but their lifespan is actually longer than people who live, for example, in Africa. Michelle, as a nutritionist, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that really comes down to education and, and just providing people with the facts. Um, that plant-based proteins can be just as nutritious um, and eating a vegetarian or vegan diet can be very healthy. Um, you know, I, th I think something that's really important in nutrition is there's no one size fits all diet for everyone. Everybody has a different situation, both nutri or, um, from a health standpoint, and we eat for so many other reasons too. So we eat for social reasons and we have economic pressures that go into our food choices. So I think it's really important to remember that a lot of things can fit within a healthy diet. Um, so we need to provide education, but then also provide support in terms of how can we help um, people make these changes from a cultural level or a social level or all of those other pieces. Yep, does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I would, I think you did a great job, Michelle. I would also add, you know, the, the facility that we have, the certified gluten, peanut, and tree nut free facility that we have on campus, uh, we started making that conversion to gluten free and in doing so, really changed and started focusing that on um, more plant-forward menuing. Um, and interestingly enough, that facility um, is a very popular location for many of our athletes. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it really, again, focuses on plant-forward. Um, and, you know, the athletes understand that 
that is more beneficial to them or can be more beneficial to them, you know, from, from a diet perspective. So, so I think that, I think, you know, to your point, Michelle, it's about education, right? And teaching and Anna, we've had this conversation also, right? So, um, you know, we've talked about creating a dining hall hacks, kind of a, a, a tool for students to understand, you know, if they want to eat vegan, here are the things that you should put on your plate. And that, that, that will give you the same equivalent of say what somebody who's eating animal proteins might get from a protein perspective or from, you know, a nutrient perspective. Because I think that sometimes it's just a lack of understanding, you know, or awareness of, you know, how much nutrient really sits in a legume or, you know, some of the other options that are available. Okay, thank you. So one last question, it's almost 9.30. So um, we really appreciate you staying this long and um, we don't want to tire you out too much. But um, it's just a fun question. We ha it's about the pop-up events and Catherine was the questioner and she wanted to know what's attendance generally like at these pop-up events. Um, do you have free food or prizes? Do they usually have an interest or knowledge about the topic or are they just learning a lot of new ideas? So maybe one example of a pop-up event that could answer those questions would be a great way to end. Um, so I can take this question. I, I'll say though that I haven't actually done a pop-up event <laughs> Um, since I've been in my position, but as I mentioned before, I was a student at Cornell and I actually did pop-up events as a student. So that's a little bit of a different angle, but I can try to answer the questions. Um, and Lisa or Chloe can pop in after if you have additional pieces. Um, so the pop-up events are usually at our All You Care to Eat locations. Um, so students are coming in to eat anyways. Um, the level of engagement may be variable depending on the topic or, you know, all different kinds of variables. If somebody doesn't want to take the time to interact or um, all kinds of different variables. But I think that having samples is um, a good way to draw people in and definitely prizes are a big seller. Um, what, what were the other pieces to the question? I'm sorry. Um, do the students generally have an interest or knowledge about the topic or they just is all what is it new to them when they go to a pop-up event what they're learning and I, I think that's really variable so there's a lot of different types of pop-up events that we do so they might be related to blueberries or mushrooms or all kinds of different things so students may know something about some of the topics but um, hopefully hopefully they learn something from all of them well, we have students also run these events to speak to their own peers. So I think that that is also, um, Michelle, as you did, that's, that's one of the important things too, rather than us just, you know, talking about it and just being a chef that's talking about it, you're talking with your peers about something. Um, and I think it definitely um, sinks in a little bit better or you feel a little bit more comfortable um, going and learning or trying new things when you're with your peers rather than just um, you know, uh, chefs, adults. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that that's a good part. We have given, um, done something called like a greens and grains, like for a week, we'll put out more grains than we've ever had before. Um, and the more greens, like some, something that we don't normally have out, um, for people to try. Um, so we'll either give samples of that or we'll just put it on the line so it's part of their, their meal that they're either paying for in retail or on, in the All You Care to Eat facility. So, um, and usually a lot of signage that explains um, the health benefits to the, the products that we have out is helpful. Great. All right, so um, Chloe, Lisa, Anna, or Michelle, did you have anything more you wanted to add or? Are you ready to get back to work? <laughs> no, I think uh, I, I think the questions have been fantastic. I really appreciate the the opportunity to interact with everyone. It's very um, it's very interesting to see uh, everybody's level of interest and perspective of where they're coming from. So I would just like to say thank you so much, Marianne, for giving us the opportunity to to come uh, and, and share this share this time with you all this morning. Well, thank you. And I just wanted to read you one here, comment in the chat. 
from Jen Hooks, who says, this was absolutely the best webinar to date, and thank you for keeping the answers coming. So we really appreciate all four of you spending an hour and a half and all the preparation time that you did for this. And hopefully we'll be in touch soon to maybe we'll have some kind of collaborations. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you, Thank you for everyone right. listening. Thank you.